again into the book of Acts, chapter 13. Um, before we do, if you take a minute and just pray with me so we can make sure that, that at least I surrender um, and maybe you can surrender along with me. God, we are here because there's something about you that, that draws us to you and yet we know we don't have a full understanding of who you are. We know that we can always grow and that you're a living God and that your presence, although we might not be able to consider it tangible in terms of a physical body, we know your presence is real and tangible in so many other ways spiritually as well. And so we ask that you would help us to recognize your presence, your teaching, your power. I ask that you would accept my surrender, that you would keep me out of your way, that we might hear from you today because that's what will change our lives. That's what brings saving truth to us, is your word, not mine. And for that, we thank you in advance. Amen. We're in chapter 13 of Acts. You know, it's, a, it's, it's been around for a while. We've been 12 chapters, and we're about halfway through, somewhere halfway through the, the book of Acts. We're going to stay in the book of Acts. But one thing that's interesting is that at the very beginning, and, and I said this, I'll continue to say this, because I really truly believe if you're going to be a part of the church, um, the thing that we need to understand is why we are who we are. It's not just what we do, but we have to understand the mission. And in my experience, um, the things that I try to build, the things that I try to do on my own, um, a lot of times they don't work out that well. Sometimes they work out according to my vision, but they're still not all that great. Sometimes I do pretty well. But if I want God to be involved, if I want, if I want the work that we do as a church to really be empowered by God, to have the, the limitless power and, and the transformative power that the church really is intended to have, we have to do it the way God wants it done. And that we find in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says in Acts chapter, now in Acts chapter 1, what's happened is, if you were just a reminder, because it helps us to remember these things. Jesus was born, he lived, he, he had about three and a half years of ministry. He got crucified and died and was raised from the dead. So he's been alive now. The disciples have gone through this with him. They've begun to understand that he really, what he meant when he said that he was going to be the redeemer of the world was that he was covering the cost of sin. By conquering death, by coming back from the grave, he has conquered the, the greatest power that sin has, and that is death. And so now there is this offer of redemption. And the disciples at this time are really excited because they have understood, most of them for their lifetime, they've understood that God had his hand on the people of Israel, on the people that we call the Jewish people, and Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And, and they understand that. How is Jesus going to change the world? They want to know what his agenda is. And mainly they want to know that because the disciples are not Jesus. They're human. And that means that they have their own agendas. And the first thing we have to understand coming to, to the book of Acts, looking at what the church looks like, this is what happens when the truth of the gospel intersects with the truth of our lives. It's what we find in the book of Acts. What we find is that our agendas are not always the same. Israel, the, the, the disciples wanted to see Jesus return to Israel what their image of victory and glory and prevalence is. They have this imagination of a strong nation, a powerful nation, a nation that's respected, that's revered, that's guided by God with a godly man on the throne, with all of the, everything that they could imagine that David's kingdom would have been like. Let's take a second and admit that they're not the first or are they the last who have an imagination about the way they'd like to see their government or their nation exist. They really want to see this. And Jesus says to them, my agenda is different than that. I'm not here. They say, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to put a king on the throne? And Jesus says, that answer isn't available. God, that is not the question God wants to answer right now. Whether God's going to restore the kingdom to Israel is not, not the question that we're to be asking. Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to wait until power comes on you from the Holy Spirit. And that's critical because when we do it on our own, when we're empowering the church, it is a weak and not very powerful organization or it is an organization driven by human power, and we have abilities. I know it, it, there are things we can accomplish, but if we want to do the church the way God wants it done, if we want to reach people 
who are unreachable otherwise, if we want to manifest unconditional love to people that have never been loved, if we want to open our doors to people who could never afford the price of admission, if we really put a cost on it, if we really want to be the church the way it is envisioned by Christ, we have to have the power that comes from the Holy Spirit. The church doesn't have an existence without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power, and the book of Acts is the story of how the power of the Holy Spirit begins to invade the lives of individuals, and they begin to share how that Spirit has invaded their lives, and as they share and the gospel gets out, people start to pay attention, and lives start to get changed, and that's how the church grows. Think about this. There were 11 who we know were instructed by Jesus after his resurrection. 11 men and, and probably twice that many women. But so there are a couple of dozen people that understood it. From that to today, there's been a couple thousand years, but there are billions of lives that have been changed. That's not because of human power. It's because it's God's agenda to save the world through the church and that message of the gospel, the, un, the unmerited grace that we get is a critical thing. It's taken 13 chapters now since Jesus said, I'm gonna I wait for the power to come on you by the Holy Spirit, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So they're supposed to leave Jerusalem at the very least. It's 13 chapters later, they finally are starting to leave Jerusalem. So let's take a look. We're gonna look at Acts chapter 13. Um, I'm gonna read the first few verses because I think it's an interesting, for this, for this um, service, we're gonna look at Acts chapter 13, verses 26 to 37. But I wanna start in chapter 13, verses, verse one. This is Barnabas and Saul are sent out to do their work, but I wanna just point out something interesting. Um, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Now these are the names, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Barnabas is a Jew from Cyprus, so that's one category. Uh, Simeon, who is also called Niger, or Niger, Niger is a Roman name, so Simeon is clearly steeped in, in things Roman. Lucius of Cyrene, Cyrene is the northern African part of, of the area. Then there is Manaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So clearly, he has friends that are powerful. He's one of the aristocracy. He is one of the important people. And then we have, of course, Saul, who is a Jew, a rabbi, a Roman citizen. He's also guilty of, of ticking off the Jewish leaders and being sent off on his own to accomplish this mission of, uh, you know, making disciples or preaching the gospel or sharing the truth. So, we have a very diverse group of leaders. There can be no doubt that in the mission of the church, part of what God wants us to do is reach out to people who aren't like us. That it is not, our, our business is not to homogenize, not to make everybody look the same and think the same and act the same and not to have absolute defined levels of power and authority, but for the gospel to reach into the lives of anybody who's willing. Because here's the deal. The gospel is not forced on anyone. The only, the only people who are part of the church, who are part of the redeemed people of God, are those who are willing to receive the gift because the gospel is an act of grace. You can't earn it. And folks, there are some, some of us never learn this, and most of us constantly struggle with this, letting us accept something without earning it. We so much want to earn things. We want to deserve it. We want to prove that we have accomplished it, that we've achieved it. There's something about us that makes us special enough that maybe, just maybe, we got something because we deserved it. When the reality is if we get what we deserve, it's not going to be a pretty picture. Trust me, you don't want what you deserve. You do not want God to give us what we deserve. What we need desperately is grace, which is God's unmerited favor. That's what we're built on. And it's important that we recognize that surrender to the to the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is what makes this thing powerful. So now we're gonna look at chapter 13, verse 26. This begins an interesting passage. This is the only full length, this kind of like Paul's first and last sermon recorded um, completely in the book of Acts. This is a, a, a sermon by the Apostle Paul. Now we're in Acts chapter 13, verse 26. I'm gonna read, I'm going to read 26 to 36. As I read it, I want you to listen for the message, the mission of the church. Like, what's really going on here? They're off. They're sent out. They're now starting to take the gospel toward the ends of the earth. 
What is the content of the message? What are, they, what are the people on the other side hearing? Listen, listen for those things. Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. When they had carried out all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead, and for many days he was seen by those who had traveled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to our people. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son, today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. So Paul's opening volley, fellow children of Abraham, meaning those of you who are born Jewish, and God-fearing Gentiles, those of you who have come to the, to the faith through the witness and not, not through birth, it is to us. Paul is including the Gentiles with the chosen people of God. This is a powerful, profound statement by the apostle Paul. The dyed-in-the-wool Jew who is a rabbi and understands the law, putting the name, putting the, the pronoun us together with Gentiles and Jews, something's changed in this man's life. He has come alive. His eyes have been opened to something that he recognizes those around him might not see. This next paragraph, this can be you and I. It's not just about the people in Jerusalem. This is about when we come close to God's message and we're surrounded by God's message, but just maybe, just maybe, our minds have been closed because we don't want change or we think we know the answer that we want and we're going to hold out for it because here's what he says next. It is to us that this message of salvation has been sent. Clearly, the message is of salvation, not obedience to the law, not even of the importance of us being saved, how we're saved, but the truth of salvation, the fact that we need salvation, the fact that that is something we can't accomplish on our own, that, the, that we're not able to obey the law, but the important piece is that salvation is the restoration of the relationship with the God who created us and the God that we need desperately to worship. If we can't worship God, we can't be fully human. We need salvation because it makes it possible for us to become fully human. The thing that we are created to do that no one else is, is to worship. We have a spiritual existence. We, we have a life that needs to be shown and we worship all kinds of the wrong things when we don't have a relationship with God where we can worship the right one, the one who's truly worthy of our worship. So this message of salvation is absolutely central to what it means to be human. The people of Jerusalem and their rulers, verse 27, did not recognize Jesus, yet in condemning him, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath. Here they are hanging out at church all the time and they're missing the point. The truth of who Jesus is, is surrounding them. They couldn't possibly miss it if they were listening for it, but because they've closed their eyes, they've closed their mind because they're fully human. And here's the deal. What does it mean to be human? means very fundamentally that we will resist every bit of change we possibly can. We are more committed to the status quo than we will ever be able to admit. We are more dedicated to stability and the lack of change, no matter how much we claim to be a reformer. And I will tell you, I'm, uh, the people that I know, I'm probably more comfortable with change than most people around me. But the truth is, no matter how comfortable I think I am with change, change is always going to be difficult for us. And if we're not willing to change, if we're not ready for God to do a new thing, for God to open our eyes to something different, for God to reach through us to someone else who hasn't heard the message of the gospel, if we miss that 
That could, the truth of the gospel, gospel can be circulating around us and we can be standing cluelessly in the middle. But here's the beautiful thing that Paul points out. He says, even though they didn't get, the pre- they didn't get what the message was, nonetheless, they were accomplishing God's will. Why? Because it is God's plan to save us. From the very beginning of the book of Genesis to the very end of the book of Revelation, there is one theme and only one, and that is God's plan for salvation. The theme starts with our need for salvation, and it goes through a whole lot of other stuff, but salvation history would be the subtitle of the book, the Bible, as we look at it. It is the story of salvation history, our need for it, God's plan for it, and the way God's gonna make it happen. God can make it happen through us, he can make it happen in spite of us as well. And that's one of the choices that we have to make. Is God going to use me? Am I going to be part of God's plan of salvation, not in my own life only, but in the lives of the people around me? Or is God going to save those people around me in spite of who I am? Because we can be tone deaf, we can be closed-minded, we can resist all the change in the world, and that might, hurt, that might harm us. But what we will never be able to do is stop the growth of the church and the spread of the gospel because it is God's plan. And even though they thought they were fighting against it in Jerusalem, even though they didn't understand the words of the prophets that were being read, they were talking about Jesus as the Messiah. They were defining what that meant. And as they said those words and didn't believe who Jesus was, it didn't change the truth of Jesus being the Messiah. It didn't change the truth of God's grace poured out for us in the blood of Christ, which covers the sins of many, covers the sins of those who reject him, of those who are ignorant of him. But the truth of the power of God's plan for salvation, that can't be undone. And so the leaders in Jerusalem might be missing the boat about why it's happening, but it's happening in spite of who they are. They fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, verse 27. Now verse 28, Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, they asked Pilate to have him executed. Why? Because they were stuck with their agenda. And let's face it, their agenda was a good agenda. They were protecting the church. They were protecting God's agendas. They were protecting God's leaders and God's people. They were trying to keep things being done the way they'd always been done that the holy people of Israel not be polluted, that the rules of temple be observed, that the law be enforced, that all these things, they seem to be the right things. And let's not talk about them. Let's talk about us. Because, folks, we have to see ourselves in the book of Acts. We have to see our own churches in Acts chapter 13 and all throughout, all throughout the book of Acts. It's the story of what it looks like when God's plan for salvation begins to work its way into the lives of people, into communities, redeeming communities that bring the truth of the gospel, the message of grace, because that's the peace that is absolutely essential. They didn't get it in their heads. They didn't get it in their hearts, but that didn't change the fact that the message was powerful. Verse 32, Paul says, we tell you the good news, what God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. And he says, as it's written in the second Psalm, you're my son, today I've become your father. And then we're gonna jump now um, to verse 38. This is the, the summary. We talked about this in the last service as well. This is a summary, what's, what Paul's talking about. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Set free from every sin. You will never meet a person, not the man in the mirror or the people around you, who have not experienced sin. And if you've experienced sin, whether it's the sin that you've committed yourself or the sins of the people around you that impact your life, if you've experienced sin, you know what it means to dream, to yearn, to be set free from the power of sin. And it can happen in a lot of different ways. You know, people's bodies being broken. Not anything you did wrong, you just got cancer, right? I mean, bones get weak, muscles get torn, bones break, things like that. That, That's a result of sin. It doesn't mean that the person who's got a broken bone did something wrong and God's punishing them. It doesn't mean the person who's 
whose life is impacted by cancer has done something wrong and God's punishing them. It's not God's plan. Things are not supposed to hurt. We're not supposed to die. We're not supposed to have this strain and this stress. But while sin is alive in the world, while God's allowing it to continue until he comes again, and we don't know when that's going to happen, and it's not our business to, to, to decide that, but we experience the oppression of sin. It saps our strength. It saps our hope. It saps our freedom. It saps our love. It saps our ability to connect with others. Sin is a reality that we need to be set free from. And what Paul's saying is, listen, you can't get free from sin on your own. But God's given us a way to be set free. And that freedom from sin is in receiving the gift that we could never purchase. It is allowing Christ to do in us and through us, and most importantly, for us, the thing that we cannot do for ourselves. Because no matter how I adjust my diet, my behavior, my attitudes, my giving, my law breaking, my law following, my law enforcing, no matter how rigidly I might arrange my life and the lives of those around me, no matter how small I build the little kingdom that makes sure that everybody follows every rule so I don't have to see anybody that's any different and nothing that's uncomfortable, I still cannot accomplish freedom from all of my sin. The only way it happens is a gift from God through Jesus Christ. That's the only way it happens. And the reason this message is so important is because the witness that we're told to share at the beginning of Acts is not the witness of what Jesus did for me or for him or for her or the truth of what Scripture says about who Jesus was. It's the witness of how Jesus sets you free from sin every day, every moment. Because it's not just, I got saved. It's also, I get guided, I get encouraged, I get taken to a place that I couldn't believe. We could never be in this place, this place of relationship with God, this place of understanding the fullness of grace, this place of knowing that I can come before God and say, listen, I gave it my best shot and I blew it. God, will you forgive me? Or we can come before God and say, you know, I know, God, what you want me to do. And frankly, I'm not interested. So I'm going to stop listening. We might not even do that intentionally. I know so many people who stopped listening to God because God asked them or told them something that was uncomfortable. Something like, oh my gosh, not only are you okay in my kingdom, Russ, but... So is Jeff. Wait a minute. A, wait, a salvation that includes people like him or people like me or both people like him and me and like all the rest of the other people? Like there's nobody that I will ever lay eyes on that God's going to say, no, they're not in? You mean anybody who wants to be a part of the kingdom of God? Anybody who wants to receive salvation through grace by the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That anybody who asks that gets it? No matter what they've done, no matter how much hate they might spew, no matter what pain they might have caused for me and people I care about, you mean they're as savable as I am? That's a tough message. That is a tough, tough message. That's the message of the gospel. That's the one that's unbelievable, the one that's really, really hard to imagine could be true, that Jesus Christ can save us, that Jesus Christ can justify us from every possible sin that we could ever imagine committing. All the narrow-mindedness, all the broken-heartedness, all of the smallness of our world. Again, the message of salvation given to us, surrounding us, promised to us by God and fulfilled. Acts 13, and I'm going to close with this. Acts 13, verse 38, again, 38 and 39. Therefore, my friends, and I say this to you in the words of Paul, but these are words from my heart. I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through Jesus, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you're not able to obtain under the law. Let's pray. The most we can ask, Father, is that you would help us to live this. And it's so much easier to hear it and say it and talk about it. But you need us to live it.
and we ask you to guide us and strengthen us in that endeavor. Amen.